In this video, I want to talk to you about the enduring threat of white Christian nationalism to blacks. Stay with me. Hello, everybody. This is attorney Augustus Corbett, one half of the Defiant Lawyers. And each and every week, we bring you at least one legal analysis of some trending story regarding politics, policies, personalities, or pop culture to empower you with the information you need to defy this unjust legal system and to nullify systemic racism. If that interests you, and I certainly hope it does, please like, share, comment, subscribe, and click the bell. So yes, I want to talk to you about the enduring threat of white Christian nationalism to blacks. Now, before I get into that, of course, I want to encourage you to get a copy of my book, Education and Justice, How Public Schools Fail African-American Males. Go to Amazon and get your copy. I appreciate all of your support. And then write me a review. Please let me know how the book was an encouragement and blessing to you. And also, I have some exciting news. I want to introduce you to our new BARS reading program. BARS reading program. BARS is an acronym that stands for Black America Reading Strongly. So what we intend to do with the BARS reading program is we intend to use this as an online resource for African-American parents who have boys in public school. And the reason we're doing this is because there is a crisis that's occurring right under our noses, and many of us don't realize it. Our young men are graduating high school, those that graduate, and their reading level is way, way beneath where it should be. And that is a serious problem. Now, you may say, well, why is that such a big problem? Well, because that says that young black men don't have a passion and love for reading. It also says the public school system is not fostering that love and passion for reading. And that will have huge consequences down the road for those young men as they embark upon careers and so on. So we want to do something about it. So we are introducing, again, the BARS reading program. What we intend to do, what we hope to do this summer is increase the reading proficiency of young black males, those who enroll in our program. I'll be giving you more information in the next few days. I'm going to be having a professor on with me in the next couple of days, and he and I are going to talk to you about the importance of the BARS reading program. So stay tuned for that. I am really excited about that. One of the things that I have learned since I have been doing these YouTube videos here in the past few months is a lot of African-American men don't like to read. Now, say, well, I mean, we kind of know that, right? I mean, that's been sort of the rumor. Well, I think I'm seeing evidence that it's not just a rumor. I am seeing evidence that a lot of African-American men don't like to take the time to read. Read. There's so much that can be gained from having a love and a passion for reading. And that's why some folks don't stick around throughout my videos, because oftentimes, what are we doing? Reading. We're reading. And so some, you know, just don't have the discipline, the passion, the love for reading. And some of those brothers, they're gone. <laughs> and then we'll say something disparaging about the fact that the video is longer than they're used to. Right now, if it's a Joe Budden foolishness video, they can sit there three hours and listen to that crap. But when it's something that is imparting some knowledge, unfortunately, many brothers just don't have the discipline of reading. So how do we change that? We put that love and passion for reading in the young boys. 
while they are infants and toddlers. And we're going to show you just how to do that. I am very excited about the BARS reading program. Very excited. So we're going to be giving you more information um, as the summer moves on. All right, so let's get into the topic. Again, what we're going to talk about is the enduring threat of white Christian nationalism. Now, I put the word enduring in there for a purpose. And that purpose is, this is not a new threat. This is an old threat. This is an enduring threat. This threat has been present for centuries. We're hearing more about it now this past several years because of Trump coming on the scene and sort of motivating uh, whites to be bold and bodacious about their white Christian nationalist uh, leaning and belief and so on. But it's been there a long time, a long time, causing us serious harm. And I want to talk to you about it because as a minister, I understand both the religious aspects of white Christian nationalism, as well as the legal and political aspects of white Christian nationalism. So that's what I'm going to talk with you about today. You need to listen all the way through the end because this white Christian nationalism that I'm going to talk about for the next um, few minutes, however long it is, is having a profound impact on America and has already had a profound impact on America and is still impacting our lives. So again, this is an enduring threat, not one that just occurred. Hey everyone, I am attorney Augustus Corbett, one half of the Defiant Lawyers. Recently, I took a look at our analytics and I noticed something shocking. Many of you watch our videos and I believe you enjoy them, but you haven't subscribed yet. What are you waiting for? Again, I was shocked because I know our content is empowering and informative. Plus, our 2024 goal is to have 150,000 subscribers before the end of the year. Please help us by hitting that subscribe button, especially you young folks. We particularly want to increase our number of young subscribers. Thanks for all your continued support. We appreciate it very much. Now, I want to say from the outset that this is not an attack on Christianity, nor is it an attack on every white Christian. I am a Christian. I am a minister. And I have been a Christian going on 40 years, a committed Christian minister for going on 40 years. So I am not attacking Christianity. I am attacking white Christian nationalism. And one of the things that you should get watching this video is there is a huge difference between white Christian nationalism and Christianity. Now, I know some of you have some strong feelings against Christianity, and I'm not trying to convert you. I'm not trying to make you a Christian. But we do live in a country where the folks who make up the majority are always saying that this is a Christian nation, and many of them confess to be Christians. And sometimes it is hard to tell the difference, the way they practice their Christianity, between that and white supremacy. And again, it has had a profound impact on this nation, especially African Americans and Native Americans, white Christian nationalism. But it's not an attack on Christianity, nor is it an attack on every white Christian. There are some white Christians who are as committed to seeing the, the downfall of white Christian nationalism as some of us African Americans. There are not a lot, and there need to be a whole lot more. Many more need to step up to the plate and condemn and repudiate this white Christian nationalism. But there are some white Christians who are doing so, and they're writing books, and they're being very vocal about it. All right? So this, again, is not an attack on Christianity generally, nor on every white Christian. So let's begin with the definition. 
First, we're going to define what white Christian nationalism is, and then we're going to look at the history of it, and then we're going to look at how and why it is an enduring threat for black people, not just blacks, but my audience is African-American primarily, so I want to explain to you the threat that you and I face as African-Americans and have faced from white Christian nationalism. So what is it? White Christian nationalism is the false notion that God created Europeans and their descendants inherently superior to all other ethnic groups and ordained them to spread Christianity to non-white people. They have used this erroneous, racist, and white supremacy belief to justify slavery, colonialism, lynchings, genocide, murder, racial oppression, and more. So now let's look at this definition, and I want to break it down. So first and foremost, white Christian nationalism is based on a false notion, a false belief, a false ideology, a false way of thinking and seeing the world. And what is that false notion? That God created Europeans and their descendants inherently superior. The false notion that God created Europeans and their descendants inherently superior, meaning they have greater intelligence, they have bigger brains, they are more beautiful, their light skin is the standard of beauty, their hair is beautiful, everything about them is beautiful, superior, greater than everyone else, especially those on the opposite end of that spectrum, which would be us black people. So that is that false notion that God created Europeans and their descendants inherently superior to all other ethnic groups. And then coupled with that false belief is the belief that God ordained them to spread Christianity to non-white people. Now, I am all for spreading Christianity to everyone. I mean, I'm a minister, so I definitely want to see Christianity spread throughout the world. But not the way that white people have done it over the years and not the type of Christianity that they have spread around the world. The kind of Christianity that they have spread is a perverted Christianity. I'll have more to say about that in a moment. But the thing that I'm pointing out now is they bring God into this evil thinking. They use the name of God. They have argued and have propagated that it's not really them if something is wrong with their brand of Christianity or with their superior traits. It's not really them. It's God who is responsible. God is the one who made them superior and then ordained them to take the gospel, to take Christianity to non-white people. Now, when they talk about non-white people, they're saying essentially an inferior people, an uncivilized people, a savage people, because again, everyone else is inferior to them. That's their thinking. That's that false notion. They're saying that Jesus created them superior. They're saying God created them superior. They're saying that it wasn't their doing. It was God. So here they are bringing God into their evil way of thinking. That is very, very damaging because if it's God behind this, who can fight God? And that is the very thing that they want you thinking, and, and that's the very thing that they have convinced themselves, that it's God 
who made them superior and then gave them this mission of taking Christianity around the world. And watch this. They have used this erroneous, racist, and white supremacist belief to justify slavery. In other words, because of the notion of white Christian nationalism, if they have to enslave people to take them Christianity, then that's okay. If they have to colonize nations to take them Christianity, that's okay. God is okay with that. If they have to lynch and commit genocide and murder and oppress people to take them Christianity, that is okay because God made them superior and then gave them that mission of spreading Christianity around the world. Can you see how dangerous that is? So white Christian nationalism is essentially two beliefs, that God created Europeans and their descendants superior to everybody else, and then he also ordained them to take the gospel, to take Christianity around the world. And so thus, we hear things like, Jesus is white, or we see pictures about white Jesus, which he was not, not at all. We hear things like America's a Christian country, which it is not and never has been. How can you enslave folks for 250 years and call that a Christian country? That violates every single commandment in the Bible. But you hear those kinds of things because of this erroneous, this false notion that they are superior and have this ordination to spread Christianity. Essentially what they're saying is we're doing you a favor by enslaving you and bringing Christianity to you savages, to you uncivilized people. So, in a nutshell, white Christian nationalism is white supremacy draped in a flag and condoned with Bible verses that whites have perverted. And that's why this is not an attack on Christianity. It's that white theologians, white clergy, white ministers, white denominations, all the major denominations, the Baptist denomination, the Presbyterian, the Methodist denominations, they all use Bible verses that they had perverted and twisted to prove their warped thinking that God had created them superior and had ordained them to take Christianity to non-white people. So in a nutshell, white Christian nationalism is white supremacy wrapped in an American flag and justified with Bible verses that whites have perverted. It makes me think of this Bible that Trump is selling that reportedly has the Constitution and the flag as a part of that Bible, as if God, <laughs> this is really twisted, as if God has chosen America and has a special place for America and for whites and European descendant people. In fact, one politician, I did a video on this, said that God wrote the U.S. Constitution, which is totally junk, <laughs> totally junk. Because if God wrote the Constitution, as I said in a previous video, then that puts the Constitution right up there beside the Bible. Not true. That is the white supremacist, white Christian nationalism that they want us to believe. And I'm trying to school and educate you. Now, I want to introduce you to a book, one of the best books I've ever read. The name of the book is Stamped. Racism, Anti-Racism, and You. The authors, Abram Kendi and Jason Reynolds. It's a very, very good book, you all. Go out and get a copy of it. I'll tell you how good it is. It's so good 
that white conservatives have launched a serious attack against Ibram Kendi and Jason Reynolds. But Ibram Kendi is so seemingly much more well-known, so they have targeted him in this book when they attack critical race theory. This is one of the books that they attacked as a part of their attack on critical race theory. It's a really, really good book. So I, I just want to read a small part of it here. Um, let me go to that. So they said in their book, The Popularization of Racism, they said that <clears throat> a European named Gomez Arnez de Zorora as the first racist who popularized racism. Zorora worked for Prince Henry and his father, King John of Portugal. Prince Henry enslaved the Moors from North Africa and stole their gold. He justified the enslavement and robbery by arguing, watch this, that the Moors were savages and that they needed Christianity. See, that's white Christian nationalism right there. Way back, this is back here in the 15th century. He used Christianity to justify slavery and stealing. So you're beginning to see that this is an enduring threat of white Christian nationalism that dates back many, many, many years, many centuries. The Portuguese saw enslaving Africans as Christian missionary work. That's all white Christian nationalism. That is not the Bible. That is not true Christianity. You, as African-American people, you don't have to run from the Bible and run from Jesus because you think that he condoned this. No, this is a perversion of Christianity. This is not true Christianity. It is a perversion of Christianity. When you really study the Bible, you will see that most of the people in the Bible are black because the Bible was written over in that part of the world, not in Europe, but over in the African area, over in the eastern part of the world, right? So, no, you don't have to be afraid of Christianity, not at all. You don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. What you do is you educate yourself so that you can see that what they have told us down throughout the years was intended to support white supremacy, but it's just white Christian nationalism, all right? So this goes on to say, in their twisted minds, enslaving Africans was compassionate because it rescued Africans from being savages, basically. Slavery, according to Zerura, was ordained by God. Look at how they're twisting scripture here. Then Zeror wrote a document bragging about how they enslaved Africans. The document is called the Chronicle of the Discovery and Conquest of Guinea. And this document spread throughout Europe. And this notion of white Christian nationalism took deep root in Europe long before they got to this country. So they brought it with them. They brought white Christian nationalism with them. Now, let's get at what is the root of white Christian nationalism. It is the doctrine of discovery. Now, let's read this. This is Robert P. Jones. This is one of these white guys. I think I've introduced you to him before. But he's one of these white dudes who is not a white Christian nationalist. He is a white evangelical, but he has renounced and repudiated white Christian nationalism. And he is a valuable resource because he gives us an inside view, having grown up hearing all this white Christian nationalism. And so hearing from him is like an inside view of what white Christian nationalism is all about. So he goes on to write, the doctrine of discovery claims that European civilization and Western Christianity are superior to all other cultures, races, and religions. From this premise, it follows that domination and colonial conquest were merely the means of improving, if not the temporal, then the eternal lot of indigenous people, 
so conceived, no atrocities could possibly tilt the scales of justice against these immeasurable goods. With this fiction of previously undiscovered lands and peoples, the doctrine fulfilled European rulers' request for an unequivocal theological and moral justification for their new global political and economic exports. So this doctrine of discovery is what laid the groundwork for white Christian nationalism. And I want, let me go back because I want you to see that discovery was also in the name of the document that Zorora wrote called the Chronicle of the Discovery and Conquest of Guinea. So it's just funny how white people believe something has not been discovered until they see it, until they get there, until they arrive. Well, that's that twisted, perverted, white supremacist thinking that a thing doesn't exist until we say it exists. Now, people had been living in Guinea. People had been living on the North American continent for centuries, thousands of years. But it really wasn't a thing. It really wasn't a nation. It really wasn't a people until they so-called discovered it. So you see this doctrine of discovery right here in both Zorora's book as well as in this doctrine of discovery. And basically what it was, again, was white people saying to each other and deeming it international law that when they arrived to a country, they had just discovered it. And because they discovered it, it's now theirs. All right. Now, let's keep reading. Watch this. In essence, the doctrine provided that newly arrived Europeans immediately and automatically acquired legally recognized property rights over the inhabitants without knowledge or consent of the indigenous people. So, as I just said, once they arrived, once they so-called discovered it, then it became their legal right and they didn't care what the indigenous people had to say about it. When English explorers and other Europeans planted their national flags and religious, religious symbols, religious symbols that would likely include crosses, okay, religious symbols in newly discovered lands, as many paintings depict, they were not just thanking God for a safe voyage. Instead, they were undertaking a well-recognized legal procedure and ritual by international law and designed to create their country's legal claim over the newly discovered lands and people. The doctrine of discovery. The doctrine of discovery furnished the foundational lie that America was discovered and enshrined the noble innocence of pioneers in the story we white Christian Americans have told about ourselves. See, this is a white man talking to white people. He says, this is the lie that we told ourselves that what we discovered belonged to us. It was a part of international law. And this is why I say not all white people are white Christian nationalists. Some are out here doing the work. They're putting in work trying to undo some of this. Dr. Jones goes on to say it animated the religious and cultural worldview that delivered Europeans to these shores. Far before 1619, ideals such as manifest destiny, another demonic way of thinking, white supremacist way of thinking, right, that gave white people, Europeans, this ideal that it was their destiny from God to conquer people. It was their God-ordained calling to take land, to conquer people in the process. America as a city on a hill or America as a new Zion all sprouted from the seed that was planted in 1493. This sense of divine entitlement of European Christian chosenness has shaped the worldview of most white Americans 
and thereby influenced key events, policies, and laws throughout American history. These demonic doctrines, the doctrine of discovery, manifest destiny. Others, like the curse of black people, that whites are superior. All of this thinking permeated white America's psyche. And to this day, most white people still believe these demonic doctrines and systems of thinking to this day. And it's Donald Trump who has brought about, if you will, the resurgence of these doctrines. He has essentially said, come out with them. Come out of the closet. Be proud of the doctrine of discovery. Be proud of the manifest destiny. Be proud that God made us superior and gave us the ordination and mission of conquering the world so that we could spread Christianity and spread our superior culture and beauty and intelligence around the planet. That is white Christian nationalism. And again, Donald Trump tapped into it and he has encouraged them to come out with it. And they're with him. I mean, many, many whites are with him, especially religious whites, because a lot of the religious whites are white Christian nationalists. And by the way, this doctrine of discovery was something that the Catholic Church was a huge part of. They would issue what's known, I'm not Catholic, but it's what's known as papal bulls, where it was basically an edict, a directive from the Catholic Church saying that God is with you, go do this, go do that. That was the reason why Christopher Columbus was able to go back to Europe with enslaved people and receive the blessing of the Catholic Church. You see, this white supremacist, this white Christian nationalism, it all came out of white theology, white churches, white theologians, white theological schools, white seminaries, and it's still being taught today. The Southern Baptist Convention, the largest Protestant church body in the world, is steeped with white Christian nationalism. I mean, they still to this day, many of them are very, very dedicated and committed to the doctrine of discovery, manifest destiny, white Christian nationalism, and so on. That is the reason why they're such strong supporters of Donald Trump. And let me say this before I move on. Any black person, any black person who supports Donald Trump is either a traitor, yes, a race traitor, or an idiot. Now, I said it. I said it. And I stand by it because it is very obvious that Trump and his supporters are deep, deep adherents of white Christian nationalism, the doctrine of discovery, manifest destiny, white supremacy, and all of that that makes up that white psyche. And so why would any African-American person knowingly join forces with folks who have used this garbage to subjugate people of color, especially black people. They would have to be either foolish or they're getting paid, they're benefiting in some way, or a combination of the both. I said it and I stand by it. Now, this doctrine of discovery made its way into law. Dr. Jones talks about the case of Johnson versus McIntosh. I remember we talked about this case 
my first year of law school, and it incensed me. I got into a back and forth with the professor over this. So listen at this. The Indians were admitted, this is language from this case, Johnson v. McIntosh. John Marshall, the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, he wrote this opinion, and here's some language, and this shows you just how prominent the doctrine of discovery is in American law. He wrote, and I quote, the Indians were admitted to be the rightful occupants of the soil, with a legal as well as just claim to retain possession of it. So he acknowledged that they were here first, and they had both a legal and just claim to the land, and to use it according to their own discretion. But, but what? Their rights to complete sovereignty as independent nations were necessarily diminished and their power to dispose of the soil at their own will to whomsoever they please was denied by the original fundamental principle that discovery gave exclusive title to those who made it. That is the doctrine of discovery in plain sight and plain unambiguous words in a U.S. Supreme Court decision. Now, if you never heard of the doctrine of discovery, there's a reason for that. They don't want you to know about the doctrine of discovery. They don't want you to know about the manifest destiny doctrine. They don't want you knowing about this. You will never hear about the doctrine of discovery in a civics class, in a high school class, especially now in states like Texas and Florida. They barely want to even say that Americans enslaved African-American people. They barely even want to say that. So we know they're not going to get into the root cause of slavery, which is, again, this twisted, perverted doctrine of discovery and manifest destiny and all that other white supremacist jive that came from where? And I want to remind you of this again. It came out of the church. It came out of white churches. That's why it got so deeply embedded into this country, because if it's coming out of the church in the minds of white people, then it's God. It's God who's doing this. And again, who's going to fight God? Who's not going to believe God? If in his sovereign will, he made white people superior and black people inferior, then their attitude is, what have we to do with that? But flow with God's will. So the church, the white church, I preached a message a few years ago entitled White First. How the white church is the biggest purveyor of racism in history. That was a message I preached for months. All right, White First. That is a book that I'm going to be releasing. Roland Martin wrote White Fear. Another author wrote White Fragility. Well, I'm going to write White First, the ideal that most white Christians put their whiteness above Christianity. All right, now, that is some of the history of how white Christian nationalism took root, came here from Europe. Well, now let's look at some of the early days of this country. Let's go a little deeper. We just talked about Chief Justice John Marshall. Let's go a little bit deeper with some of the very first founding fathers of this country and see just how deeply racist these people were. Let's begin with the Puritans. The early Americans were called the Puritans. They were European Protestants in the 16th and 17th centuries. They had issues with the Church of England because they believed it was too heavily influenced by the Catholic Church. So they sought out to reform the Church of England. They wanted it to be more pious and pure in its theology. Their reform efforts failed, and thus many of them started moving to the northeast region of the USA. 
All right, here are three of those pioneers. Notice they're all ministers. The Reverend Cotton, Mother, the Reverend Richard, Mother, the Reverend John Cotton. These men laid the foundation for America and laid the foundation for white Christian nationalism, white supremacy, the doctrine of discovery, the issues that we deal with racism today in this country. These men are largely responsible for that. Who are they again? The Reverend Cotton Mother, the Reverend Richard Mother, the Reverend John Cotton. Now, let me demonstrate why I say that these men were deeply racist. In a paper called The Negro Christianize, the Reverend Cotton Mother wrote, it has come to pass by the providence of God, the providence of God, in other words, the will of God. This is God's doing, the providence of God, the sovereign acts of God. Can't nobody stop the providence of God. So he's laying on God. He's blaming God for everything that he's getting ready to say. All the racist stuff that he's about to say, he's blaming God for all of it. And that's very important because, as I said earlier, if you believe God is doing something, if you can't resist God. If you want to convince people that God is doing something, if you want people to really believe you, tell them that God is the one who's doing it. That is a way to manipulate people, right? That is a way to cause people to really open up to what you're saying. So that's why he starts out by saying, it has come to pass by the providence of God, without which there comes nothing to pass. In other words, this, what I'm about to say, is coming to pass because God ordained it and there is nothing no one can do about it. That poor Negroes are cast under your government and protection. That poor Negroes. Now, he's not talking about them economically. He's talking about blacks. When he used the word poor, he's saying unfortunate, pitiful, sad, pathetic people. That God, by the providence of God, made them inferior to your government and placed them in your protection. And so he says, you take them into your families. Not like a family member, but more or less like a mule or a puppy or some other possession. He goes on to say that. He says, you take them into your family, you look on them as part of your possessions, and you expect from their service a support and perhaps an increase of your other possessions. So you work them so that they can help you increase in more possessions. These unfortunate poor people that God cursed in his providence. That's how deeply, deeply racist the founders of this country were deeply and they blamed it all on God. It's like, what are we to do? If God and his providence has cursed these people and placed these people in our care, then nothing can happen unless God sanctions it or permits it or even wills it. And when he used the word providence, he's saying that God willed for black people to be inferior to white people. You see the level of sickness here? And the thing is, this still today is how many white people think. You see, let me tell you something. If you say that white people hate black people, the average white person is going to push back. And say, no, I don't hate black people. I got black people in my family. There are black people in my job. No, I don't really hate black people. What you should say instead is, you think that black people are inferior. Yes, that God created them inferior and created you 
superior. That gets to the root of the racism. Now, some of these races are blatantly racist and, yes, hateful and mean and so on. So, yes, you got that crowd. You got the the KKK. You got the Nazis. You got all of those. But the average white person will deny hating black people. But what they won't deny, or maybe if they do, or, or even if they do, they're lying. Most of them believe that blacks are inferior because that goes deep into the very grain of America. And again, it was brought here by European people. And notice again how Christianity, how they have used it and perverted it to promote this white Christian nationalism, racist, white supremacist garbage. So he says, <clears throat> who can tell but that this poor creature there is saying it again, this poor creature. It's like, oh, I know it's a sad situation for, for the Negro, but it's, it's, it's between him and God. All I know is um, he's inferior, I'm superior, and he has ended up in my care. So I'm going to use him. I'm going to use him like I would use my puppies, like I would use my mules, like I would use my hammers. I'm going to use them for my advantage. Don't blame me. I'm just doing what the creator ordained before the foundations of the world. He made me and he, he made me and my stock superior and made them inferior. So in fact, I'm doing them a favor by enslaving and colonizing them, as I said earlier. And he says as much. Listen, who can tell but that this poor creature may belong to the election of God? He may even, in other words, he's saying that this poor, unfortunate creature may even be a Christian. Who can tell but that God may have sent this poor creature into my hands that so one of the elect may by my means be called and by my instruction he may be made wise unto salvation. The glorious God will put an unspeakable glory upon me if it may be so. So he's saying here, this poor, unfortunate, God-cursed creature may end up in my care and may even be able to become a Christian. Maybe. I mean, he's, he's essentially saying it will be hard for this poor, uncivilized savage to become a Christian. But maybe I can say something or do something as I work his back out, as I treat him like he's less than my animals, I still may be able to cause him to become a Christian if he has that capacity. And I say that because there used to be, and there still is thinking, that black people don't even have souls. I had a white man to tell me that about 25 years ago. <laughs> that he was told that black people don't have souls. Now, this is not 1910 or 1810 or 1710. This is just 25 years ago. A white man told me that he was told that by other white men. The considerations that would move you to teach your Negroes the truths of the glorious gospel as far as you can and bring them, if it may be, to live according to those truths a sober and a righteous and godly life. Like, wow, you may be able to get these savages to become Christians. Now notice what he didn't say. He didn't say if they become Christians, you should free them. He didn't say that about these poor and fortunate creatures that he claims God in his providence Curse to inferiority. These are the founding fathers of this country. These men were some of the founders of some of the most prestigious universities in this country. Harvard, Princeton, Yale, and most of those schools that I just mentioned were theological schools at first. Harvard University was founded by these 
racist, white Christian nationalist. Okay? Now, so this white Christian nationalism, this doctrine of discovery, are also written into our founding documents, the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Don't have time to go over it, but they're there. The founding of our country. And by the way, I think about Nikki Haley having the gall to say that this country has never been a racist country. Wow. Frederick Douglass, he has some things to say about white Christian nationalism. He wrote in his book, in August 1832, my master attended a Methodist camp meeting held in the Bayside, Talbot County, and there experienced religion. What we today would say, he got saved. I indulged a faint hope that his conversion would lead him to emancipate his slaves, and that if he did not do this, it would at any rate make him more kind and humane. I was disappointed in both of these respects. It neither made him to be humane to his slaves nor to emancipate them. If, if it had any effect on his character, it made him more cruel and hateful in all his ways. For I believe him to have been a much worse man after his conversion than before. You want to know why? Because he didn't get saved. He got white Christian nationalism. He got a heavy dose of white Christian nationalism, not salvation, not true Christianity. Prior to his conversion, he relied upon his own depravity to shield and sustain him in his savage barbarity. But after his conversion, he found religious sanction and support for his slaveholding cruelty. So he started hearing from the ministers that you're doing the right thing by enslaving these black people. Because after all, the Bible says, the Bible says, servants obey your masters. And the Bible says that they are cursed. The Bible says that if a servant doesn't do his master's will and he knows to do it, he shall be beat with a many stripes. These are all these verses that have been perverted to bring about servitude from black people. So Frederick Douglass said his master became even more cruel and it was now sanctioned by religion. Watch this. He made the greatest pretensions to piety. His house was the house of prayer. He prayed morning, noon, and night. He very soon distinguished himself among his brethren and was soon made a class leader and exhorter. His activity in revivals was great, and he proved himself an instrument in the hands of the church in converting many souls. Yet he was mean, cruel, hateful. How can that be? That is certainly not the character of Christ. So how can that be? Because he got white Christian nationalism. Not true religion. So here are some of the churches and some of the famed preachers who also had white Christian nationalism. Again, the Southern Baptist Convention, the Methodist denomination, Presbyterian denomination, Catholic Church, George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, Charles Finney, these men own slaves, and some of these denominations own slaves. That's not true religion. That is white Christian nationalism. That is still a huge part of what we see today. So, fast forward to today, and we see that Christians as a whole, 47% of those who attend church at least monthly, 
say they have a favorable view of the former president. That's on par with 46% of non-church attending Christians who say the same. Among white evangelical Protestants, 68% of regular churchgoers have a positive view of Trump, similar to the 64% among white evangelicals who don't attend church regularly. So why do two-thirds of white evangelical Protestants support a man like Trump? And that's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to outline his many flaws and failures and immorality. I'm not going to do that. But just ask yourself, how can a people who profess to follow Jesus follow a man like Trump? Because most of them have white Christian nationalism. That's why. And remember what we said white Christian nationalism is. It is white supremacy wrapped in a flag justified by Bible verses that whites have perverted. A more technical definition we said is the false notion that God created whites superior and then ordain them to spread Christianity around the world by any means necessary. Slavery, colonialism, all the rest. And that's what we see with a lot of white Christians. It is white Christian nationalism. So, white Christian nationalists have created white Christian America. And what is white Christian America? It is the belief that God ordained and used white Christian men to build America, and their interests, values, and perspectives should continue to dominate America. So the uproar that we saw on January 6, 2021, were mainly white men who were trying to protect, in their minds, white Christian America. As they were being motivated and inspired to do so by their leader, Donald Trump, who said to them, if you be weak, you're going to lose your country. And remember, this was the same man who dogged and disrespected the first black president, former President Barack Obama, because he was just as incensed as they were that a black man had the audacity of hope to become the president of the United States of America. What, in other words, had America become? Some of them felt like their forefathers, their ancestors were rolling over in their graves that this black man had become the president of the United States of America. They felt like this had gone against all the traditions of America. The doctrine of discovery, manifest destiny, the notion that only white men could lead and had the intelligence, the brains, the smarts to lead this nation, not a black man, especially one with the foreign name Barack Hussein Obama. So that turned their stomachs. And one of the first things they did was the Shelby County versus Holder case where they began to gut the Voting Rights Act. They said, we got to turn this around. And how are they getting this type of person, this black man elected? Because of the Voting Rights Act. So it's time to go after the Voting Rights Act. That was 2013. This is 2024, 11 years later. They have doubled down. Now they want to gut the Civil Rights Act and anything else that might open the door for a black person in the Oval Office. Where does that come from? 
Where does that hate come from? White Christian nationalism. So they're, they're fighting to save white Christian America because they believe God ordained them, white men, to build this country. Never mind the fact it was the African-American slave who laid the foundation and did the, the back-breaking work for this nation. Never mind that. So why is white Christian nationalism dangerous for black Americans? Because in their minds, black power and black progress threaten what they value the most. Again, the ideal of a white Christian America. Now, not the type of Christianity that the Bible talks about, but that other style of Christianity, again, that is used to justify white supremacy and the doctrine of discovery and all that other garbage that white churches, white denominations, the Catholic Church, said was perfectly okay. Hence, they worked tirelessly to neutralize the threat of black power and black progress. That's what they do every single day. In the United States Congress, for example, every single day, the GOP wake up thinking, what must we do today to stop black progress? And many of those same people teaching Sunday school, their deacons, they are confessing Christians. But they have a unique style of Christianity. Again, it's white Christian nationalism. I heard a black the other day say that he too is a Christian nationalist. He couldn't say white because he's black. And he explained it this way. He said that he's a Christian and that he is a nationalist in the sense that he loves America. That's not the type of nationalism in white Christian nationalism. Loving your country is fine. That's patriotism. That's okay. Nationalism is based on ethnicity. It is white Christian nationalism. It is the love and belief that the white European race is superior style of nationalism. That's what a nation is. A nation is a group of people who share heritage, ethnicity, culture, and this black and no other black person share European ethnicity. So when they support white Christian nationalists, when they support white conservatives, they're not truly a part of that because they don't share the most fundamental part of white Christian nationalism, the white part and the nationalism part. And I would also say they don't even share the Christian part unless they believe God created blacks to be inferior. Is that what you're saying, you other black Christians, that you believe God created white people superior and black people inferior? Is that, is that why you're supporting white conservatism and white Christian nationalists? So why do Christians support Trump, 68% of them? Because Trump has one mandate. He has one job, and that is to save white Christian America by any means necessary. His supporters believe it is a God-ordained mandate that justifies violence if necessary. We saw that January 6, 2021. That's Trump's mandate. That's why they couldn't care what this man does, because he is to them the savior of white Christian America, although he's never confessed to being a Christian, to my knowledge. He certainly doesn't live like one. So that is white Christian nationalism and all its ugliness. 
something that dates back centuries, literally centuries. Long before those, those founders even arrived to the shores, they were already enslaving and subjugating African people. They brought that with them here. And all of it was stoked in Christian doctrine, twisted doctrine, not the Bible itself, but twisted doctrine, what I call white theology, Western theology, the kind of theology that makes it okay to worship God and then go to a lynching or to worship God, have Bible study with people, and then murder all nine of them. That's white Christian nationalism. That's not true Christianity. And it is an enduring threat that we face to this day. What I can say is the days that are ahead of us will be very trying days. All right, thank you for watching this video. I am attorney Augustus Corbett, one half of the Defiant Lawyers, and we bring you this type of content, just straight up, no chaser, truth and facts, so that you know exactly what we're dealing with in this country. So please like, share, comment, subscribe, and click the bell so you'll get notified when we upload one of these videos. Until the next time, Peace.